may know, I have a podcast called The Crime Cafe, and I have a Patreon page for it. What I would like to tell you about is I am offering for a limited time, starting, I believe it's August 23rd, it's towards the end of August, um, a free copy of this book, pre-release, to um, supporters at the $5 level. So if you know of anybody who enjoys crime fiction and would um, be interested, please share this video and uh, let your friends know. And if you're interested, please feel free to check out the Patreon page, which I'll include a link to with this video. In the meantime, I'm going to read to you another part of Deep Six. This is the part after um, Sam is called by an old friend from college to help her on a case that she's involved with. At 11.30 on the dot, I walked into the restaurant, housed in a pseudo-French farmhouse circa World War I, and was escorted to a table next to a big picture window, where the waiter removed the napkin from my goblet with a flourish and poured my water with equal ceremony. Linda was nowhere in sight. The place had a low wooden ceiling with thick parallel beams and a brick fireplace in the corner. I vaguely recalled seeing a show on the History Channel about bombs buried under real farmhouses in Europe during World War I as a defense against the Germans. The British were taking steps to tunnel down and recover them. However, some of them were going off accidentally, possibly due to lightning strikes. I sat in my solid wooden chair and admired the detailed recreation of history including the brass pots and pans hanging near the fireplace and the mantel clock. A bookshelf lined one wall. A piano player banged out a recorded ragtime tune in the background. Each table was adorned with a pristine white tablecloth draped over a red one, and full place settings arranged around a candle flickering in a cut glass holder, in hopeful anticipation that someone might sit there. No threat of the Kaiser, no bombs concealed below the painstakingly decorated eatery, none that we knew of. I shifted in my seat. For some reason, my jaw felt rigid, so I tried smiling. Then I figured sitting by myself smiling made me look goofy, so I stopped. My mouth was dry, so I sipped my water. One sip of water didn't quench my thirst, so I took another. My mouth still felt dry. Why was I so nervous? I looked around again at the tables, all neatly set, waiting for customers. So far, the only takers were myself, one quiet couple, and a group of four men and two women who, all in suits, were talking about sales figures and laughing too loudly at each other's jokes. I turned away to gaze out the window, guzzled water and watched a Cessna make a lazy circle over the landing field. Linda came in about 13 minutes later, moving through the room with the fluid grace of a gazelle and the self-assurance of a woman on a mission. A smile broadened across her pale, freckled face, and her wavy red hair flowed back as if blown by a secret wind. The air seemed to freshen in her presence, as if she'd brought some of the outdoors in with her. I stood and we hugged. Sam, she said, it's been too long. Feels like a million years, I said, overlooking her tardiness and lack of explanation. You were with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service the last time we spoke. Can you believe I'm still there? I'm probably a lifer, even though they make me do more with less budget every year. But how many jobs are out there for biologists? She shrugged. The bureaucracy and paperwork just seem to worsen over time, too. But if you can ignore the bullshit, it's decent work. I know what you mean. My problem was I couldn't abide the bullshit of office politics and bureaucracy. That's why I'd left the Prince George's County Public Defender's Office years ago to start my own practice. As we took our seats, she said, I'm really sorry I'm late, but I got way late at the office. I waved my hand. Don't worry about it. It's so great to see you again. You're well worth the wait her and the free lunch. We scanned menus the waiter had left with me. 
Linda chose the cob salad, but urged me to get whatever I wanted. Well, okay then. I decided to go all out with filet mignon, since Linda was paying. This meal could be both lunch and dinner. After the waiter took our orders, Linda turned to me and said, How's business? Fine. Never let them see you sweat. Even if they're old friends you haven't spoken to in forever. Not if they're going to be your client, maybe. Linda peered at me. Are you all right? You look a little pale, I guess. I shook my head. No, no, I'm always pale, remember? I never could get a decent tan. Plus, I don't feel like playing games, and why are we talking about this? Linda raised her eyebrows. Okay. I sighed. I'll be honest. Things are a bit slow right now, but they'll pick up, I'm sure. They always do. That's me, Little Miss Sunshine. Linda leaned toward me and touched my arm. I wish we had more time to catch up, but I can tell you about my case, and you can see what you think, okay? <clears throat> I sat up straighter. I'm all ears. Linda leaned back in her chair and folded her hands on the table. Two years ago, I started a local activist group where I live. It's named Citizens Advocating Sensible Development, but everyone calls it CAST. She pronounced the acronym C-A-S-D, as if it were spelled C-A-Z-D. We're trying to preserve a large tract of undeveloped land in southern Prince George's County, where I live, she continued. The group plans to appeal a zoning decision that would pave the way for a big new development. 500 plus acres of former farmland has been rezoned to let a developer fill it with houses, offices, and stores. Interesting, I told her, but I'm not a zoning expert. But it's not that hard. It's all politics, really. Couldn't you please do it just this once? Okay. Meeting an old friend you haven't seen in years is awesome. Doing an old friend a favor is awesome. Mixing business and pleasure, sometimes not so cool. And this contact from my long-lost friend had tripped my bullshit meter now. Big time. Have you thought of approaching any local firms, I asked casually? Many of them will take a case like this pro bono just for the publicity. She shook her head. We tried three or four firms. They've offered, we've offered to pay. No one wants to fight Greyback. Is that who we're talking about? No wonder no one would take the case. They were probably all fighting for his business. I felt torn between fears that I'd be in over my head trying to fight Greyback and a weird thrill at the prospect of doing it anyway. I guess you've read the articles about this, Linda twiddled her thumbs, a tiny vertical line forming on her brow. The fact that Greybeck is a minority-owned business and this push for upscale development is in a mostly black county doesn't help us. The press is playing the race angle as if the environmentalists were a cross between Greenpeace and the Klan. Sometimes I wonder why we can't all just get along. I'd often had that same thought, knowing that if it came to fruition, I'd be out of a job. Our food arrived, and she fell silent pushing her salad around on her plate a bit. I sawed off a large chunk of my filet mignon, bit it off my fork, and chewed. Perfect. I was still thinking of all the reasons to turn this down when she said, we're willing to pay you eight grand up front if you do this. <clears throat> I swallowed my bite half-chewed and felt it inching down my esophagus like a mouse through a snake. I grabbed my water and gulped half the glass. When I set the glass down, I could swear the meat was still stuck somewhere near the bottom of my esophagus. Well, at least no one needed to perform the Heimlich maneuver on me. I raised my napkin to my lips. That's more than generous, I managed to say. We were willing to pay that to the other firms, so it's yours if you want it. My mouth went slack. How... Who, where did you get this money? The group got together and collected it. I peered at her. Really? I pictured a bunch of hippies handing out flowers for donations. Our members have resources and friends with money. Ah, that helps. I was ready to offer another polite demurrer. Then I remembered Jamila Williams. 
She worked as a real estate attorney for one of the biggest firms in Prince George's County. She was definitely politically connected. I could consult with her on this. Jamila and I were tight. We were there for each other when the going got tough. Well, I said, I feel funny about taking a zoning case, but for you, I'll consider it, okay? I still had misgivings, but with 8,000 reasons to take the case and a stack of unpaid bills, I couldn't say no. <clears throat> After we dispensed with that, Linda seemed to relax. Thank you, Sam, she said. You have no idea how much this means to me. Let's not get carried away. I said I'd consider it. Linda, please don't take this the wrong way, I said. But I need a day or so to think about this and make sure I have the resources to do a good job for you. Do you understand? She reached out and touched my arm again. Of course, you have to do what's right for you. Linda leaned back and smiled. You haven't changed a bit. I thought about that. Was that really true? Oh, I don't know. Well, I can tell. You're as stubborn as ever and probably a hundred times better than most of the high-priced lawyers in this county. Well, I said, being stubborn doesn't mean jack shit when it comes to being a good lawyer. She laughed. See? That's why you're the best. You're honest. Thank you for that. I hope you will consider my offer. Please. After we finished eating, Linda said she needed to go back to the office right away. She flagged the waiter over, pulled her wallet from her shoulder bag, and retrieved an Amex credit card. A platinum an Amex credit card, to be exact. The waiter hustled over through the nearly empty room and presented the bill in its folder, like an engraved invitation. Linda gave it a cursory glance, nodded, then stuck the credit card in the slot and handed it back. The waiter hurried off. Here's my card, Sam, Linda said, pulling a shiny gold-colored metal card holder from her shoulder bag. She popped it open with her thumb and retrieved a business card with her agency's logo on it from the stash within. I'll write my home and cell number on here, too. While she scribbled that down, I fished around for a business card and a pen, finding both. I paused, then wrote down my cell number, which I normally don't give out to clients. That was my second mistake, after thinking I'd gotten a free lunch. That's uh, the end of chapter one, actually. So, if this interests you at all, I'm including links not only to the, the Patreon page, but to the pre-order page for this new book coming out in September. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Thanks.